Thank you and welcome everyone who's joining us today. If you're here to learn more about how you can use SEO to make the most of your digital presence, then you're in the right place. I have a couple of quick things to go over before you begin. This is a 30 minute webinar with a lot to go over. Apologies for the late start. We had some technical difficulties on this end, but we're gonna do our best to address the questions that some of you emailed us in advance. And we definitely wanna continue the conversations. So we encourage you to reach out if you still have questions from our team. And then after the webinar, we'll go ahead and share the presentation with you all. So rest assured that you'll have the resources you need to make the most of your web presence. Let's get started. For those of you meeting us for the first time, we're Madfish Digital. Madfish Digital is a values first digital marketing agency specializing in SEO, paid media, content marketing, and design. We're based in Portland, Oregon, and recently ranked number six in Oregon's top 100 places to work. And we received an award for best green workplaces in Oregon. In 2018, Madfish Digital became B Corp certified, putting people before profits. We're focused on being a business as a force for good, and we're committed to continuing growth and working to be a better business. Before we begin, I wanna introduce those of us who will be speaking to you today. Uh, my colleagues, Jessica Martinez and Ben Herman, and myself, Sierra Sigelski. Jessica works at Madfish Digital and brings experience with both local and enterprise level experiences, or I'm sorry, clients across a wide range of industries. She's driving results and placing them ahead of their competitors. She's passionate about the ever-changing world of search marketing, and she's tenacious with innovating new strategies that are both measurable and effective. Ben is one of the founding partners of Madfish Digital and has been working with and optimizing websites for search engines since 2003. Ben has focused his 15 years of SEO strategy experience on growing B2B and B2C companies around the world. Through Ben's leadership, the company has been recognized as one of Portland's fastest growing companies three years in a row. And I'm your host, Sierra. I have extensive experience tailoring customized digital strategies across a wide range of industries and businesses. What I enjoy most is the opportunity to partner with values aligned businesses and supporting nonprofit organizations with the pro bono hours that Madfish offers. Thank you, Jessica and Ben, for bringing your expertise to the conversation and for joining us all today. In today's webinar, we will go over some of the ways you can use SEO to make the most of your web presence. We'll start with the difference between on-page, off-page, and technical SEO. Jess will take us through the elements of on-page SEO and what matters most. And Ben will share insights on content optimization and canonicalization. He will also take us through the details of technical SEO and important status codes to know. We'll share a few useful webmaster tools, the importance of collaborating with your internal teams, plus some other things to get started. So you're here today because you see an opportunity to improve how your site shows up online. And we're here to help you make the most of your digital presence. Now is a really unique time we're in. 63% of marketers are immediately increasing their focus on SEO. Think about your customer. Where are they right now? They're probably at home and they're using search engines. They're watching YouTube videos. They're chatting with Alexa all at record levels. People depend on the content they find to make nearly every decision of their life. They're asking Google, where to eat near me? They're searching what to watch on Netflix. They're asking Alexa, who sings this song? Before your current and potential customers are picking up the phone, if they're even picking up the phone, they're online and they're searching. It's estimated that over 20 billion searches are happening every day. People need help. 
So the big question is, are you being found? And what are you losing out on by not being found? I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Jess who will start things off by explaining the different types of SEO. Thanks, Sierra. Hi everyone, and thanks for joining today. As a strategist, my job entails account and project management, but most importantly, as the name implies, working with clients to develop a strategy to meet short and long-term business goals. When I talk to clients about their SEO strategies, most of them say something along the lines of, we were working with so-and-so agency to improve SEO, but we didn't see the results that we wanted. And SEO in this case is used as a blanket term. In a lot of scenarios, the agency was actually doing what they were hired to do, which is most commonly on page SEO. But unless you understand the difference between the different types, you'll continue to have false expectations. So the three types are on page, which is, which is visible content and HTML source code. So these are things like your blog posts, your page copy, et cetera. Off page, these help to improve rankings based on perceived popularity, relevance, trustworthiness, and authority. These are gonna be like your backlinks, your social media, uh, that, type of, that type of stuff. And technical SEO. So this is the behind the scenes code to help the algorithm crawlers understand your site so that they display your site in search results. For today's webinar, we're gonna just be discussing on-page SEO and technical SEO. So looking at on-page. Title tags are important because they display in three key places, search engines, web browsers, and social networks. Meta descriptions are what populates in search results. They can directly impact the click-through rate, which Google and Bing have both set as a ranking factor. And what a lot of people don't know about meta descriptions is that if the crawler doesn't like your description, they're going to pull content from the page that they think better describes it. You'd be surprised how often these are overlooked or just duplicated across an entire site. And I can guess what some of you are thinking right now. I know title tags and meta descriptions, this isn't advanced at all. But this tip I'm going to share with you is what separates general SEO from advanced SEO. And the tip is that there's actually not a right way to write title tags. You'll commonly see SEO agencies recommend that the name be included in the title tag or that it has to be a certain length. But in all honesty, that isn't a fact. The biggest mistake SEOs make is having a set it and forget it mentality around meta tags. Instead, you should constantly be testing, play around with length, keywords, call to actions, numbers, and even emojis. Here's a quick look comparing two very popular brands for the query women's hiking boots. They have almost identical title tags, but when you get into the meta descriptions, you can see REI uses free shipping to loop in the customer and provides value by mentioning quality, selection, and advice. The North Face just simply lists their products with zero context as to what the consumer can expect. No surprise, REI ranks number one on page one and the North Face is deep down into the next page. Next, I wanna talk about H1s. So do they really matter? Although Google hasn't said that H1s are in fact a ranking factor, you should still very much consider headers as a part of your on-page strategy. A couple of reasons include um, helping with accessibility. So this is definitely a ranking factor and one which I believe will become a bigger consideration for brands. As more and more people move online and society makes a shift towards an equi equitable user experience for all. They could also be used in search results in place of title tags. So again, going back to whether or not the crawler thinks your title tag is good enough. And in studies across the industry, they have been correlated with higher rankings. In the screenshot to the left, this Pampers listicle is a great example of using headers to rank within the people always ask SERP feature for baby strollers with car seat. So incorporate headers to develop a more advanced on-page strategy with the goal to populate and SERP features like PAA, not just in position zero or one. Images. So everyone in the SEO world knows image file names and alt text are important, but without avail, they're always overlooked when we do our technical site audits. And that's despite the fact that 20% of all searches happen on Google images. 
Like meta tags, Google uses file names and alt text to help determine the best image to return for a particular query. You're going to want to use keyword rich descriptive file names and alt text. So here are a couple of screenshots of Google Trends for web search and image search for the term fall dresses over the last 12 months. You can see here that image search is actually on par, if not higher some months than web search. And on this next slide, these are screen sh screenshots of the first page of web search, re search results for fall dresses. You'll see the obvious big names like Target, Macy's, Nordstrom, Lulu's. But then when you take a look at the image search results, these big brands that were ranking on page one are nowhere to be found. So they're missing out on all of that image search traffic that you saw on Google Trends, likely because of the lack of optimized file names and alt text. So when you're working to create on-page content, don't forget to include time and dedicate energy into image file names and alt text. Now I'm gonna pass it off to Ben. He's gonna go ahead and answer a viewer question and round out on on-page SEO with thin and duplicate content. Excellent, thanks Jess. So one of the questions we received was about the Yoast plugin. And Yoast is a plugin used for WordPress. And what it does is um, you, you activate it and essentially it lets you customize meta tags, title tags, and it has some SEO tools included in it um, that do everything from checking keyword usage on a page uh, that you've written to giving you kind of like a red light, yellow light, green light in terms of um, the size or character length of your, your title tags and meta tags. And so the question here is how effective is the plugin? Um, it's, it's effective from the sense that it allows you to customize your tags uh, really nicely. We use it in the, in the SEO world and SEO club. Absolutely. It's a, it's a tool we all use. However, just on its own, uh, just activating the plugin wouldn't get you the results that you're looking for. Uh, if you think of it like a wrench, sure, a wrench is always, it's an effective tool, but it's how you use it and what you use it on that uh, makes the difference. So um, as far as the plugin being effective, yes, but you still got to put in your customized uh, meta tags and title tags and write those, uh, those from scratch and they need to be unique. So cool. Then in duplicate content. So then in duplicate content pages uh, can be one of those hidden issues that seem small but, but hurt big. So search engines consider a page to be a duplicate when the same page content um, is accessible by multiple URLs. If a search engine finds a high number of duplicate or thin content pages in your website, these pages or even your entire domain could drop in rankings. We call this type of ranking drop in Google a filter. Crawling your website regularly is a great way to stay on top of this type of problem, as you might not always be, um, be aware of it. So in, you might not always have a crawler either at your disposal. So here are some easy questions to ask yourself to see if it'd be worth it to, uh, to dig in further. Do you have a large number of posts or pages with potentially low word count? Um, think about posts that you know, would have uh, maybe just a video on it or just a sentence um, and then like a link to a PDF or something. Um, do you have single content pages that can be accessible by multiple URLs? Do you have multiple locations that have a different image, but maybe all the same text? Um, do you have any commerce site? Um, we'll just leave it at that. So large e-commerce sites do tend to be rife with pitfalls since single products can oftentimes be accessible under different categories and those categories can affect the final product URL, um, of that page. So good thing to kind of stay on top of. We typically see that in Magento um, and sometimes in WordPress sites when people try and use it for e-commerce. Shopify tends to be a little bit better, but it's not always perfect. Is your site accessible by HTTP and HTTPS? Uh, oftentimes, yes is the question. I mean, it should definitely be accessible by HTTPS. If it's also accessible by HTTP, it should be redirected to the HTTP version. Another question to ask is, is your website hosted on a Microsoft Windows server? And the reason that that's important is because Microsoft Windows servers tend to allow camel case in the URLs, while traditional Linux servers are always case sensitive uh, when it comes to URLs. It, that's definitely a question um, most people might struggle to answer. So definitely ask your web developer if it's not something you, you already know. 
So diagnosing. Luckily, diagnosis is easy. So you can call an agency like Madfish, of course, or you could also use a web crawler such as Deep Crawl or Screaming Frog. At Madfish, we do prefer Deep Crawl, but we do use Screaming Frog a lot as well. Um, you can also use Google Search Console, which we'll actually cover a little bit later. Um, and you can use that to review the number of index pages in your site. Sometimes when you use a tool like Google Search Console, you can tell right off the bat that you might have issues when uh, Google is showing like thousands of index pages, but really you know that your site may only have like 40 to 50. So that, that's usually the, the first sign that, hey, there's probably a crawl issue going on here. Um, you could also go post by post in your website, um, but we don't recommend that. I farther recommend using an actual crawler. So um, when it comes to resolving the issues, um, once you've kind of chosen your preferred method of detection, whether you're going page by page or, um, you know, finding all the problematic URLs with the crawler, we recommend getting a measurement of each page's current traffic count and the number of external links. If there's a set of duplicate pages, um, you would want to canonicalize or redirect the lowest traffic URLs to the most visited version of that page. So you can use the external link metrics in the same way. Um, so you can get a sense of what are the, the more important pages and which ones should be kind of considered the, the pages you should keep. Um, so if there's a set of duplicate pages, obviously canonicalize it. Um, but if it's truly like a page that has no use, um, it is okay to 404 them. So, or like that would mean uh, deleting it and then it would return a 404 code on your, your site. And that tells the search engines that the site or that the page is, is broken or gone. So. Um, if a page is receiving minimal or no traffic um, and you, you do want to delete it and let it 404, then we recommend no indexing it first. So typically that's done through adding the meta robots no index tag to the page. And that tells search engines that, hey, this web page, it, it needs to be removed from the index. And then once it's removed from the index, then you can delete it. Um, some people in our industry in the SEO world do say like, hey, don't, don't no index, it can take a long time. And that's true, but the time frame's actually based on how authoritative a website is. So it's going to have more to do. The timeline's going to have more to do with how often Google is crawling your website. So typically, on a, a site of one of our clients, we do see Google react in about seven to ten days. So seven to ten days, the page gets kicked out of the index, and then we would delete it and let it 404. There's also a status code called 410, um, which tells Google it's a little bit harsher than a 404. Um, there's times to use it. It tells Google the page is never coming back, um, but 404 or 410 both work fine. So crawling your way to success. Um, if you can't tell by now, obviously we're big advocates for uh, the automated crawlers. So at Madfish Digital, we do tend to use Deep Crawl um, and Screaming Frog the most. Um, Screaming Frog has a free version that's quite comprehensive, and they also have a paid version with with some more features. Um, deep crawl options are a bit more pay to play. So deep crawl does have more of an enterprise approach uh, and it's a tool we often use for clients with larger websites. So um, we are also a deep crawl partner. Um, and it again is because we, we very much believe in their tool set. Um, whichever crawler you end up choosing um, to run regular, regular crawls on your website, um, you know, we recommend um, picking at least one. So you're basically going to be using them to identify any low hanging on page SEO fruit. So think duplicate title tags or missing title tags or duplicate meta descriptions. So being able to identify those on a global scale, the crawler will help you do that. Helps you to uncover ranking issues that were maybe holding your website back in search. Um, and you can also use them to improve the user experience of, of a website because it helps you stay on top of broken links. The crawlers will give you a report that actually just tells you, hey, here's a page, here's a blog post from six years ago that has a broken link now. So you can go update it. Um, and that we look at as more for the user experience. There is some SEO benefit to that. But um, again, there's it's really difficult to stay on top of those things, um, especially as you have a site that's kind of growing and evolving and that has been around for a little while. Um, yeah, you can proactively monitor your website and catch bugs that get introduced to your site when the dev team pushes up new updates. So again, using that crawler, um, we see the dev teams for clients a lot. I mean, they'll push an update um, that maybe the marketing manager wasn't aware was going up. It was to fix some other little problem, but hey, it introduced a bug that maybe took down a section of blog posts or caused uh, certain links or a certain page to, to 
appear broken. So uh, again, crawler helps us find and fix that um, right away. So it's much easier to find those technical site issues like right after a page launches or even on the test environment before it launches um, versus finding out one to two months later when the rankings start to drop um, and we have to go trace back the problem to a bad update that went in place you know, weeks ago. Next, I'm gonna talk a little bit about canonicalization. So it's got a complicated word, but a basic meaning. So in computer science, uh, canonicalization means converting data that has more than one possible representation into a standard normal or canonical form. So basically, if you have multiple unique URLs um, that are, they all have the same content, but um, could be accessed. Um, so it's same content accessed by multiple URLs. Um, only one should really be considered uh, as the single source of truth. Um, and so in some cases, there are valid reasons for why duplicate content would appear within a website. And in these cases, your web developer would add what's called a canonical tag. So that's a little bit of code that gets added to the head of the um, HTML of the page. And it tells the search engines that, hey, this one page is a single source of truth. And all of these other pages, um, they're necessary. We're going to have them in our website, but don't, don't index them. Just index this one primary page. We know the others are duplicates, but we're not trying to like game the search engines or something because that's why that tag exists. People used to game the search engines by creating duplicate pages or near duplicate pages a long time ago. Um, and Google doesn't like to index those, but sometimes by accident it does happen. And that's where the, the canonical tag comes in handy. Um, in most cases, the search engines are smart enough to only choose one URL. Um, however, it's always better to use the canonical tag to help them out rather than making them guess. Um, you know, this always comes in handy with large e-commerce sites um, because you're dealing with things like pagination, sorting features, product variants, and URLs that, again, I, I mentioned it before, but they can be created from a, a single product being listed in multiple categories. So again, we see that a lot with Magento, and it just means um, having a strong kind of canonicalization strategy. So where do you implement these updates? Well, if it's an issue with duplicated content and you need to tell the search engines which URL is a single source of truth, um, then you've got to do it using those canonical tags. You'll need to determine which page is kind of the primary version um, and which are the non-primary versions of the page. Then add that tag to those pages, all of those pages, specifying the URL of the primary version of um, URL. So um, another thing to watch out for is if your site um, is available by both HTTP and HTTPS uh, versions of the URL, um, the canonicalization that occurs there is when we redirect uh, the HTTP version to the HTTPS, because remember, canonicalization is basically the, the act of, of normalizing things, making it accessible by one. So we, we don't want the same content to be accessible by multiple versions of a URL. Um, and when that's the case, we have a redirect that we would use in that, you know, for the HTTP to HTTPS or the canonical if it's specific to, to certain web pages. Technical SEO. Um, earlier we touched on on-page SEO, which covers changes that people can make to web pages that, that help those pages get better, you know, understood by search engines. So again, think your title tags, meta tags, etc. Technical SEO is a little bit different. So it, it addresses SEO items that are more on a programming and, and coding level, stuff that your server can affect, but also require maybe a little bit more technical adjustments to your content management system or the, the tools behind the scenes that drive the website. That's why they call it technical, right? So an example of some of these items that are technical are, we've listed them here, but it's your HTTP status codes, it's your page load speed, duplicate content, um, your SSL setup, uh, internal links, structured data, uh, meta robot tags, and then your site's robots.txt or sitemap XML file, and, and of course, canonicalization, right? Um, multiple versions of a page. So um, those are the items that typically we look at in a technical SEO audit. And while they're all super important, um, we're a bit pressed for time today. Uh, so I'm only going to speak on the top status codes that we look at and maybe a few issues around them. So HTTP status codes. Um, yeah, the name alone sounds really technical, but once you understand what these are, um, it's pretty easy to wrap your head around them. So essentially the status codes 
are um, sent by a web page to a browser. So every time a page loads, um, there's a bit of information kind of behind the scenes that a web page is actually sending to a browser. So that then the browser knows how to treat it. Um, it knows what to do when it loads the page. So um, the most common status codes where we tend to see issues um, are around 301, 404, and 500 uh, status codes. And so these are actually the numbers so, um, that get sent over to the browser and the browser treats the page differently based on the number that it, it receives. So for 301 redirects, um, it's basically the whole concept is like when you tell the post office to forward your mail from your old address to the new one, um, it's a signal that tells search engines like, hey, you need to update the index, this old URL should now point to this new one. And so what happens there is that sometimes uh, web developers accidentally implement it as what's called a 302, um, uh, a 302 redirect instead of a 301. And it's just as simple as it sounds, meaning like literally somebody plugged in the numbers 302 instead of 301. So the fix is pretty quick, but what it tends to do while that old 302 redirect is in place is that it tells the search engines and it tells your web browser that the, the, the move from the, you know, that, your move from URL one to URL two or from your old apartment to your new place is only temporary. And we don't want it to be temporary. There's times to use that, but it's very rare. We want to, we want to tell Google that it's permanent. So that's why we do a 301 redirect. And another kind of power move there is never 301 redirect your sub pages back to the home page. So 301 redirects are a great way to kind of recapture any link equity that have accumulated at a certain page that maybe you're not going to use anymore and you need to close that page down, but you don't want to lose the, the ranking value that's been accumulated there. You can redirect that to other areas in your website using the 301 redirect. However, if you redirect it back to your homepage, which we see people do all the time because they say, hey, I don't have this product on the site anymore. Just send someone to the homepage. Um, yeah, that's a big problem because Google will actually, anything redirected, any sub page redirected to your homepage will not be counted um, in the link equity graph by Google. So 404 errors are another big one. Um, again, that tells browsers that the, um, and search engines that a page no longer exists. So oftentimes website pages that do return a 404 error will still have incoming links um, and equity for a website, but it's not counted by Google because it's returning that 404 code. So the best way around this is again, you implement that 301 redirect to channel that, that old page to the new one. Um, and again, this can get really complicated on a large website to stay on top of these, like just about every website that we look at uh, for a new client has these types of issues. It's very common. And using a web crawler is the way we do it to stay on top of proactively uh, monitoring all of these pages to um, help folks avoid, you know, the 404 errors and get the 301 redirects in place because it's inevitable. It just happens. It's part of website management. So um, the last piece is four, 500 errors. And the 500 errors are um, a bit more complex. Basically, if you are seeing a 500 error show up in Google Search Console or on your search crawler or even on your, your web browser, um, it means that there's a problem with the way the web page is interacting with the server. Um, this does get a bit more complicated to resolve. Um, if you ever come across these or see these, I would report them to your web developer ASAP because it can be indicative usually of a larger problem. If you're, if you're seeing one 500 error, there's a reason why it's happening and it's usually affecting a large portion of the site, but it's not always easily detectable to the human eye. So um, it's rarely just localized to one single page. It's usually affecting a whole section of your site or there's some code that went in place that's causing the problem um, on a global level. So definitely something to raise. Um, and it's a, a huge issue. Oftentimes it's a quick fix, but um, big problem. So uh, 500 errors are definitely um, worth digging into further if you come across them. So a few useful webmaster tools. Um, the first one, uh, Google Search Console. <clears throat> so. On the uh, URL inspection tool, we use this a lot. And it's an often overlooked tool for kind of SEO troubleshooting um, in Google. And so um, basically the Google Search Console, you know, there's many features, but it's our favorite by far is the rendering um, a screenshot of a website. And it helps you to get a visual representation of how crawlers see on-page elements in, in your site. So some top uh, common problems that we tend to see um, that Google Search Console helps us to detect. 
um, is, you know, basically oftentimes when you, when you run your site for the first time through Google Search Console, uh, through their analysis tool, you'll see a funky rendering of your site. And we got an example of the Madfish site here on the right. So, um, and again, this was in the past, this is all well resolved, but um, one of the things that, um, that, that we see, I mean, this is super common, it's usually settings at your host. <clears throat> and so um, it has to do usually with CSS and JavaScript files being blocked uh, or incorrect uh, content delivery network or CDN settings. Um, or conflicting caching tools. That's another big one. So those are kind of the top three areas that would prevent a site from showing correctly to the Google crawlers. But again, when you go look at the page in your mobile device or on a browser, it looks fine. So some steps that, that we took to then fix it, because this is what it should have looked like here on the right um, for our services page. Um, <clears throat> basically updating the robots.txt file to no longer block some folders, um, configuring the CDN to allow bots, um, you don't want to just allow any bot, but Google has a bot. So um, same with the other search engines. And sometimes uh, the best of intentions with these filters that hosting companies have in place will accidentally block Google's crawlers from, from accessing your content delivery network, which is where your CSS and JavaScript files tend to be stored. And those are the files that um, your website uses to properly show the images, um, the font styles, the sizes of things. Um, you know, it, it's super important. So without those, you get that image that you saw on the previous screen, um, which where everything's broken. And the other thing we did on ours was, oh, sorry, uh, was the caching plugins. So um, updating, uh, there's WP Rocket, which is our favorite. Um, there's a lot of caching plugins out there. Uh, WP Rocket, I think it costs $50 annually right now. Um, it's worth it. It makes the site load quicker and it's super easy on the install. A lot of the other caching tools out there are super complex and they're free, which is nice. But um, if you do truly want to like set it and forget it, um, which I recommend on the caching side, then WP Rocket is, is where to go. Um, so next I'm going to hand it back to Jess and she's going to take us through Webmaster Tools and a couple more slides and then we'll wrap things up. Awesome, thanks. Uh, so Bing Webmaster Tools, I'm not going to go super into depth with Bing uh, because as I state on the slide here, Bing shouldn't be used instead of Google Search Console, but definitely should be considered as a part of your strategy. Google still definitely has a majority market share when it comes to online traffic. Um, so again, this, is, this should just be used as a compliment. What some people don't know about Bing is that that algorithm actually also powers Yahoo. Um, it's the default search engine on all Windows products, which are estimated to be over 1.5 billion products worldwide. It's also the default algorithm for all Amazon and Cortana products. So think Alexa voice search and gaming consoles like Xbox. In fact, Amazon has also started to integrate Alexa into smart car manufacturers like Audi, BMW, Volkswagen, Ford, and General Motors. So a couple cool features about Bing Webmaster Tools uh, they recently did an update to their platform that looks really similar to Google Search Console, so it's pretty intuitive. You can also submit URLs for quicker indexing, get consistent SEO reports to troubleshoot issues on your site, scan your site like you would through DeepCrawl and Screaming Frog, and even do keyword research all within that tool. <clears throat> Excuse me. I also listed Bing Places for Business, which is essentially just like Google My Business and will definitely help your local SEO, and it'll be necessary to help your brand appear in those voice searches I was talking about as Alexa's integrated into more and more uh, cars. In this next section here, I just wanna talk about the power of collaboration. So in most cases, especially when clients are going through website migrations, they're working directly with developers, and completely overlook the importance of truly understanding what the developers are working on, what it means for their site in the long term, and what success looks like. Developers and SEOs are not synonymous. Developers won't be looking at your site from an SEO lens, just as SEOs won't always have the answer to how to solve technical issues. That being said, having an SEO agency will help your team understand what's going on, the implications for the long term, and whether or not they're things are being done with the algorithm in mind. To give you a visual of how you should think about digital marketing uh, and how everything works together, I really like to show this little graphic. I didn't come up with this metaphor, but I did hear it somewhere and I liked it. So think of yourself as a fisherman. 
In order to catch fish, you need a fishing pole. That's your website. You can use a stick, but to catch the big guys, you need a good pole with a great foundation. That's where your technical SEO comes into play. But without bait, you'll likely not catch anything either. And that's where your other strategies come in. It's your on and off page SEO, content marketing, paid media, um, any other tactics. And so now's a good opportunity to answer a question that came in from one of our viewers. The question is, I have a client that because of what he sells can only accept buyers in a specific state. He's annoyed that 60% of his traffic comes from out of state. Is there anything I can do from a technical or on-page point of view to heighten local traffic or reduce out-of-state traffic? Great question. First, now that we've discussed a bit of what on-page and technical SEO both encompass, to me, your answer lies in the third type of SEO, that's off-page. Make sure your local citations are all accurate and your client's brand is displaying on the right directories. If you haven't already, make sure you're also optimizing for being places for business. Secondly, reframe the conversation with the client. The biggest, advantage, the biggest advantage to hiring an agency to help you manage your business's digital marketing strategy is that we have the time and are literally dedicated to your strategy because that's our job. Click-through rates, time on page, bounce rate, backlinks are all known ranking factors. Regardless of whether or not these visitors are converting, this additional traffic is 100% helping his site rank in results. If he's looking for a specific increase in conversions, then maybe it's time to take a step back, look at the strategy as a whole, and determine whether or not another strategy outside of SEO is best for his business. And so to wrap things up, I'll end on what should be your first step. So before you jump right into downloading Screaming Frog, consider these couple of questions. So what, which internal team members do you need to involve? Um, you know, who's gonna own this project? What's everyone's role? Who needs to make final approvals before changes go live? What types of agencies will you need to hire? So SEO and development. What's the timeline from start to finish? Do you have a budget range for starting and finishing this project? And what are you expecting from this project? Is everyone on the same page? So next, create an audit checklist. Work with your internal and external teams to understand what's important. Having a fundamental baseline for what to look for will help you to improve areas of your site as they relate to ranking factors. Create a checklist that works for you and your team. This can be an Excel sheet, a shared Google spreadsheet, or a regular document, whatever makes the most sense for all teams involved. Here at Madfish, we use a point system for each checklist item to give a site's total score so that we have a baseline to measure any improvements against. When we present our findings, we usually assign perceived priority and even designate who's in charge of what next step. And so here we did list a couple of checklist example items, but there are loads more. Google alone actually uses over 200 ranking factors. We certainly didn't list them all here, nor do we know them all, uh, but definitely make sure to include fundamental items in your checklist, like your indexation issues and duplicate content, but also work with your SEO partner to make sure you're addressing the more technical items like page speed and mobile friendliness. Understanding how to read your audit findings will help you to decide your next steps and which category of SEO they fall into. Knowing if your next steps are on page, technical or off page SEO will allow you to constructively work with your SEO partner and set the right expectations. Thanks again for joining us today. I'm gonna to pass it back to Sierra to wrap things up. Thanks, Jess. And thanks again for everyone who joined us. Um, I know we went a little over on time, so if you stuck around, really appreciate it. Hope you got um, a lot of good information from my colleagues, Ben and Jess. Um, if you had to dip out earlier, we'll send you this recording. Um, so hopefully you have everything that you need. And as I mentioned, we'll send a follow-up email with just a few resources that we covered um, in the presentation. So Madfish team is always happy to connect if there's any other questions. So please reach out to us through our website or shoot us an email. Thanks again, everyone. Take care.